you don't have as many moves in this one as you do in the next two, but I think it's better this way. In this one, it's still all about strategy in the fights. Almost all of your enemies are bigger than you, tougher. They feel like a genuine challenge. And like in the original, there isn't constantly combat. And fights often feel quite epic because you really feel like you're accomplishing something by defeating these large and tough enemies. To completely defeat an enemy, you have to stab them with the Dagger of Time, and that'll then restore some sands to you, which you can use to rewind time, slow down time, or this ability where you kind of move really fast and attack back and forth between kind of so fast that they can't quite defend themselves. There's of course a romance subplot between the prince and Farah. I think they did pretty well with it. There are some cliches in it, but on the whole, it's not too bad, and there are some entertaining lines in the process. You do basically only fight one type of enemy. Other than the birds you fight, all of your enemies are big, slow, and tough. There aren't really any small and fast ones. And don't get me wrong, the enemies do move plenty fast. Also, if you try to run away from them, they will teleport to where you are. You have to remember these are affected by the sands of time. A fight will go on until you've killed every enemy in that area, again unless it's like birds or bats, and gotten their sands back. As you progress through a fight, you'll notice that, I don't know, let's call it a vortex of sorts of sand will slowly take shape, and once it's done, you walk into it, then you get kind of flashes of things that are going to happen later, I don't know. Honestly, I never really cared for this aspect, I don't really think it adds anything. I don't know, does the game feel the need to tease what's going to come later to ensure that we keep playing? And there's also a kind of useless thing about, you know, in some of them you see him die, but obviously you don't because you get further, or if you die, you just rewind time. Anyway, after that, you can save there. Oh, also, in all three of these games, there's something that you'll want to get used to seeing. Because you're going to see it a lot. In this one, it's the prince waking up after having entered a vortex, and him sheathing his sword and the dagger of time. Because the latter, you're going to see after almost every fight. You can also sheath them by yourself in this one, if you're gonna try to quickly get some more health, which you do by drinking from water. And he's very indiscriminate about the water he drinks. It doesn't matter if, if he's walking in it, if it's from a fresh spring or more questionable sources, like bath water. Disgusting. Well, what's an immune system if you ain't gonna use it? This is really the proper way to do a new game on this concept. Fresh, memorable puzzles driven by dynamic acrobatics. The camera is good if it does at times inconvenience you. There's a regular, almost 360 degree free camera that can't always be turned quite that much depending on where you are in the game a first-person view, and a panoramic view that sometimes helps in determining where you're going and how you're going to get there. As far as length, I would say this is in the middle of these three. I've played it twice, and both times it's taken about two days of playing to get all the way done. The fighting is versatile and easy to get into. Not everyone will love the game, but if you like this sort of thing, if you like what the first did, if you like puzzle-driven action-adventure, then you probably will. I just really love and deeply respect that the fighting has no button-mashing, no stupid combinations to have to learn. You just instantly get into it, and then it's a matter of timing and skill. Like in real life. You don't just get to use really powerful moves and somehow win. Just because the enemy didn't pull his powerful move first, 
and because he can't defend against your powerful move. Like the first three, this really doesn't have very much replay value. The only one that does really good at that is the third one, I'd say. The second one makes an effort, and maybe some find themselves for playing that one, I don't know. Honestly, in this entire trilogy, the puzzles are great, and a lot of the way I really love playing them. Honestly, this first one, all the way I love playing it. Hey, you can go bar hopping without getting drunk. There is not a lot of interaction with the environment other than what you can for the puzzles. I mean, you can break vases and such, but that's it. I mean, you know how in Max Payne 2 you can knock over something and it's not going to further your mission, but you can still do it? Or in System Shock 2, how you can pick up a pool cue. It's not going to help you complete the game, but you can still do it? Nothing like that here. The game utilizes checkpoint saving, and in addition to the vortexes where you can save, it also does somewhat save your progress at other points so you don't have to go terribly far back. And the sands of time will also help you not have to go very far back when you die or make a mistake and lose a bunch of health. However, if it doesn't ask you if you're saving, then obviously if you quit the game and then load your most recent, you won't be as far. Anyway, I love the game. I would recommend it to anyone who loves jumping around, flipping off walls, and I don't mean in the offensive way. Anyone who loves games where the enemies really are tough and you can feel that you're fighting someone. You're not just dispatching them all with ease. And quite challenging puzzles. Granted, the boss enemy, and there really is only the one, is way too easy to be a boss enemy. It is the easiest fight in the entire game. And that's a bit unfortunate. They fix that in the next two. It might be good if it had more than one difficulty setting. You know, the next two have three each. And this is also the only of the three that has no collectibles. The music is great. It's kind of rock with very clear Persian influence. Moving on to Warrior Within. It's been years since the events of the first game. The prince finds himself hunted by a large humanoid creature called the Dahaka, the guardian of the timeline. As it turns out, you're not supposed to survive opening the sand. The prince is now literally fleeing from his own death. From an old mystic, he finds out that there is a so-called island of time where the so-called empress of time created the sands of time. It is said that this island holds time portals and the prince is now determined to travel to the island, confront the empress in the past, and prevent the sands of time from being created. The very first time you get to control the prince in this one, you're defending your ship against troops from the island of time. Now your men are being absolutely slaughtered. I think that's supposed to signify that these island of time troops really don't mess around, but I don't know, I never really quite got that impression from it. Maybe there should have been some line about, you know, the prince then brought the greatest warriors he could gather from his father's sultandom and travel to the island of time. I don't know. Maybe especially because you yourself so easily dispatch of at least these early troops from the island of time. As you may have already heard, this is darker more emo than the first one. I quite like how the guy at Zero Punctuation Reviews put it. They went around the office and shot everybody who was smiling. The music is now hard rock with some Persian undertones. This darker tone is quite consistent throughout. The first brief portions of darkness, but overall was a bit lighter if still set in a very threatening environment, but it's almost the kind of Silent Hill kind of thing with this was so recently just a regular place, you know, where people hung out and were happy. It doesn't look sad on its own. It's because it's abandoned that it looks sad. 